So you think of uh, recovering parrots, captively breeding parrots. You're kind of like, okay, well, you know, it's not like it's big cats. That's that's dangerous, you know. But then I just read <laughs> that macaws have a bite power of three times of like a German Shepherd dog. And so I was like, well, actually, maybe it isn't that safe. <laughs> is that true that macaws can, like, take a finger off? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, of course. The palm cockatoo is one of the third bite more stronger in the, in the world, like jaguars or, uh, or, or alligators. Welcome to The Possibilists. The Possibilists is now a partnership between Pelicanus and Reverse the Red. In this series, we will highlight the scientists, organizations, institutions, and communities focused on reversing the trend of biodiversity loss and recovering species on the IUCN Red List. We're so excited for this partnership and to get these amazing success stories out to the world, spreading optimism for the conservation of biodiversity. In this episode, as part of our year of action, the theme for February and March is birds. Austin and Taylor Parker talk with Rafael Zamora of Loro Parque Fundacion in Tenerife, Canary Island, Spain. The mission of the Laurel Parque Foundation is to conserve wild species and their habitats through environmental education, research, sustainable breeding programs, and activities they develop with local communities. They have achieved so much in the conservation of so many species, but today, Rafael will talk about the work they've done with recovering parrot species around the world. Enjoy our conversation with Rafael. I am Rafael Zamora. I am the scientific director in Loro Parque Fundacion. I work here since more than 20 years. Right now, uh, the evolution in the time, uh, I, I can introduce you what is Loro Parque Fundacion. Loro Parque Fundacion and Loro Parque. Loro Parque is the zoo. Uh, the zoo have uh, right this year 50 years of uh, old. It's a long time. And here is the largest genetic reserve of parrots of the world. Uh, that means that uh, around 350 species and subspecies of parrots are maintained here and presented to the public. And uh, the Loro Parque Fundacion have a breeding center, uh, uh, a very special place where we maintain right now 4,000 parrots. And they breeding every year around 1,000 chicks of all of these species the most of them are endangered and uh, we are expert all the all the team in parrots that is our uh, most important things and that is a distinction in the whole world and many people over the world come in here only to see parrots but we have other animals we we worked with uh, uh, golden lion tamarins or hippos or different species that are in the park to sensibilize the, the people that come in here, our visitors, more than one million every year. And here we have the animal embassy, where I am uh, right now in my office. And in the animal embassy, we present to the public laboratory, clinic, all the public can see how we work in front of the, of the public every day. And we have a basis of the Max Planck Institute, the Cognition Institute from Germany, that uh, working directly the researchers from every part of the world and working with parrots and they develop knowledge and uh, scientific articles about the, the, the cognition of parrots that is very, very important and not so developed like in primates and other animals. And that is really, really interesting. All the things that is uh, working with uh, animals under the human care uh, is right now the most important tool, uh, the most important powerful uh, tool to conservation. We, we make, we put together these all this old things, uh, maintain animals under human care and the conservation in nature. We put together and this is the, our system to help the species in nature and doing conservation, real conservation. I think a good place to start would be kind of to back up and just let's talk about parrots. <laughs> I guess yeah. the first question is why, why parrots? Why parrots? That, that, is, that is really interesting. Uh, here, the, the first seed was our uh, fundator. The fundator is Wolfgang Kiesling. Uh, he's uh, a man from Germany who started uh, here in the Canaries because he, he, he saw here the, the place that have the perfect weather and the climate is perfect for maintaining 
animals. But at first, uh, they look in because we, we are in eight islands in the medium of the ocean and uh, it's a little bit disconnected in the past with the mainland and the continent of Africa or, or Europe. Now we are from Europe. Uh, the weather condition was perfect. That was a paradise uh, to work with animals. But uh, his father told him maybe parrots is a better idea than starting with giraffe or, or elephants that need so uh, much work and so much uh, food. Uh, they thought at this time that only with uh, a little bit of grains you can maintain the parrots and they starting only when with 150 parrots with, of different species, a group of flamingos and other things and that developed in the largest collection as first of parrots in a time 50 years ago, not all the biologists knowing every species Many species was uh, bred here for the first time. That is very important. And uh, that is uh, right now the most important uh, safe net of uh, animals of the world because we maintain this group of parrots, this genetic uh, pool, uh, we maintain in a sustainable system uh, where the pales can produce his own uh, species and the parrots are the ambassadors of the parrots in nature. So, well, okay. So you threw out a lot of numbers there and they were all just super impressive. But so you said that currently you have over 300 species of parrots. Is that, was that correct? We have worked with around 350 uns uh, species of and subspecies. This is uh, yeah. impressive. It's something that never happened in the world and it's very difficult to to reproduce something uh, like this. It's really, really difficult. So the lo your location has the largest uh, genetic pool of, of parrots in anywhere in the world. And you've said that there, you've, over the years, you have 30,000 parrots that were born at, El, El, at the Loro Park of Fundacion, right? Yeah, that's true. That's, that's insane that's it's that's like that's so many parrots <laughs> it's a lot every year 1000 chicks uh, sometimes 1500 that is a lot and uh, it's very important because we have a resource uh, for every country of of the world that have a problem with parrots we have all these birds of course without uh, any illness or any mutation or we we have everything under under control and uh, uh, that is not only impressive it's very helpful for for nature because only the data and only the scientific articles that we can do right now and we can produce right now with the most in, important laboratories and and scientific uh, centers over the world is amazing we're working with the Poland university we have a net uh, a net of uh, scientific uh, places that are working directly with us the whole year. I don't know if we've actually talked about this, but our um, mascot flagship species is the pelican. And here in Southern California, it's the California brown pelican. And the idea behind using the pelican was it was almost extinct. It was endangered. And we changed some policies, stopped using some chemicals, and they came back. And so that's kind of our our model there is is... And it's it's perfect for all the parrots because exactly what you guys are doing. But not only just for one subspecies of one species, you guys are doing it for hundreds and hundreds, literally all over the world. So it's it's just so impressive and and exciting. And so it sounds as if the Laurel Parque Foundation, you have many different arms of your organization. There's the conservation, the research, the actual rescue, the sustainability, the education, like teaching the sustainable breeding of parrots. Uh, it's, it's so impressive. So you kind of already mentioned a little bit about each of them, but um, because you're a captive breeding expert, you've been doing it for 20 years, can you talk a bit about more about that program and, and how, how it actually works a little bit into the weeds, I guess? Okay are many things uh, all together, yeah. and, but this is really interesting. All of our projects are connected with the people. Conservation must to be connected with the people. Uh, education 
always el Loro Parque Fundación since uh, 1994 when Loro Parque Fundación have started uh, the education department was always there uh, because the children can learn very fast and when they come into the zoo they learn a lot right now the red list in every every signal of the information of every parrot every animal that we keep here they can read the status in the red list that is very important we, because not all the people look into the parrots and to the info but uh, together with the emotion to feel the when you hear a parrot where you smell a gorilla that are near you here our the, the zoo the loro park is very special it's not a conventional zoo uh, is a place where the, you cannot uh, see barriers uh, between the gorillas and you. And we have a, an EEP program very important when, where we maintain only males uh, to send males when they are silverback later in other zoos over the world to maintain the species uh, correctly. And when the people coming here and seeing directly that, they can learn. And we, we take this opportunity with our educators to show to the people how important it is to conserve nature. This is our, our main tool that is very important. And on the other hand, we can make research. Why? Because we are in front of the animals every day. And that is uh, something that for the biologists on the field is very difficult. When, when uh, I have the opportunity to go in the different projects uh, on the field with the biologists there, they, they are always absurd because they say, ah, you, you know the voice of every parrot? Every... Yeah, of course, because I am always here with them. I, I have not a, a short contact with the parrot and I hear only the voice. No, I know every different uh, voices that they uh, using the, the parrot. That is a big advantage. What we do is when I go to Bolivia, I go to the university and I give lecture to the, all the people there. Uh, the biologists and veterinarian uh, can learn a lot about this and I can share this information with them. And when we go directly in Colombia with the, the ornithologists that working with, uh, they are bird watcher and they want to see their birds, I, I can give a lot of info and they give me back a lot of info too. When we put together, we can make amazing things. I didn't know, honestly, I'm going to be completely honest. I didn't, I never heard of Laurel Parker Foundation before we talked to Megan. And I, after I looked it up, I was like, how did I not ever hear about this? This is insane. They're like, they literally are bringing parrots back from across the, the entire world. Yeah, the, we are on this, at this point right now. We share all this information and we want to be more present in every corner of the world where we can really help. We were mentioned two times, the first uh, zoo, the best zoo in the world, that is uh, by uh, the, the TripAdvisor uh, portal. That, that is very important because the people that come in here making the vote that we are the best zoo over the world. That is a big honor, uh, but this is the normal people that are not involved in conservation. That, are, that is the people that we want to convince to help uh, nature. And for this, only with knowledge or only with the uh, work on the field is very difficult. We need now to be present in every corner where conservation is uh, really active. That is what we want. 52 million people have visited your zoos um, and received information about uh, the, the work that you've done. You're, the zoo has been around for 50 years. Uh, more than 100 animal species have been successfully reintroduced from the zoo into the wild. Uh, your team supports more than 240 conservation and research projects around the world. These are some of the, the, the numbers. I mean, these are big numbers. Uh, 30,000 parrots born at Laurel Parque, eh? 1,000 per year sometimes. Of the approximately 400 parrot species in the world, not including subspecies, you have 350 at your zoo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, the numbers just keep going and going. Um, more than $25 million dedicated to protecting birds and habitats. But the number that I am just astonished by, and Austin spoke about this with you know Pelicanus and why we started, is that you have pulled 12 species of parrots back from the brink of extinction. Yeah. And, I mean, it's a... 
to us, to people that are conservation minded or just even like, you know, somewhat interested in environmental stuff, to hear that one species has been pulled back is an incredible story. But you've done it 12 times. Yeah, it's a lot. And the, the, the last two was uh, last year in 2022. We are very proud and it was a big effort. Sometimes at first uh, we're helping only with the financial uh, support. But right now with the technical support, the improvement is amazing. It's amazing. And we can communicate better now. Uh, if you see how many, only in the, in the last two years, we produce around 20 scientific articles uh, in the most important uh, papers or the most important uh, magazines that are of the high impact level. That, that, is, that is amazing. We, we, we work with the Max Planck. We work with the CSIC. That is the scientific center, the most important scientific center of Spain. And they working in the study of the neotropical parrots and we making census in nature, in the whole neotropical and by under the human care, because we realize that it's very important to know what happened with the birds that are with the people by the indigenous or by the different uh, countries. It's very important to know because when you put together, you have a lot of keys to, to solve the, the problems in every corner. Uh, is impressive. Uh, the most important thing is that it's effective. What we do, uh, I can say, I am convinced that we we can do more and will come many, many things more because right now uh, we see how the countries, the governments of the countries working with the different species that are quite extinct. Sometimes it's too late but when you have the zoos of the world, the accredited zoos that are in the best level, when they, they fix the protocols to breed the animals, it's more easy or it's easier to help the animals. And we create the, the, this safe uh, net before the problem is there. And right now, the, the history, uh, one of the species is the, the Lear's Macau. The Lias Macau in Brazil. Uh, I remember when we got the, the the call from the government of Brazil. They they asking us. We were two biologists here, one German and me, and they calling us and they saying, "Look, you have success with the Spix Macau. Could you do with the Lias Macau? Because we have two pairs here, confiscated birds that in many years didn't uh, done anything." maybe you are prepared to do this that is a challenge and we accept the challenge and we we got the two pairs that is very difficult to import animals wild animals to other country with all the papers and so the documentation is crazy the bureaucracy but we are prepared because we move animals constantly that is another advantage of the of the zoo and uh, when we got was the end of 2006 in six months, in 2007, we got the first egg and the first chick. Until today, we have 40 exemplars. We bred 40 exemplars of Lear's Macau, and uh, we, were, we, we were really proud because it was a sensational. We, we bred speaks, we many, many species. We, we have success, but at this time it was very important. But later, we have the opportunity to reintroduce the species in Brazil in one place where historically was quite disappeared. Only two exemplars uh, were there in the Caatinga Brasileña in, in Brazil. And uh, we prepared eight exemplars to send to Brazil back. We, we already sent 19 to the ex situ and in situ project of, of the species. And to, to work directly with the uh, Sioux of Sao Paulo and other a breeder, scientific uh, breeder that have centers there to work with the same protocol like us. Right now, Brazil breed with, uh, with the species and eight of our animals that were sent to Brazil were reintroduced with success, with a big success in nature. They flying in the first two, uh, in the first three months perfectly. And right now we have one chick in nature that was born with the number 41 at the end of last year. And that is amazing. That is when you close a cycle and you, you have done everything perfect, every step. 
And believe me, it's not easy. It's, it's, uh, many people are involved, veterinarians, biologists, laboratories, the people in Brazil, politicians, all, all the people, the biologists in the field are fantastic. We have Erika Pacifico, is a biologist uh, in the field that, who knows perfectly the species. And together with the government of Brazil in Simbio, uh, one institute that work with the government, uh, we have the people directly there. And we are proud because our animals can breed now in nature. And that is not only put free the animals, animals that coming from Tenerife, born in Tenerife, and uh, that uh, were like kings that receive uh, every day the best food. And when the biology on the field, hand, uh, having the hand, the animals, they say, ah, oh, they come from a gymnasium. They are very strong, plenty of muscles. How is possible? Okay, coming from us, but they need to be like the animals in nature. And that was not easy because in nature, in the Caatinga, they have only a fruit of a palm that in the center have a little coconut that keep one drop of, of water. The only water that they can find on this habitat. And our animals, like princes here, or like prince or, or kings that receive the best food, suddenly need to learn how to eat the palm fruits, how to find, and how to crack and broke this little coconut that was very hard, in the same time, like the birds in nature. And uh, at what point in a big flocking cage that we installed in the middle of the, of the Caatinga, we must to retire the water and seeing what happened. And at final, they have done on the same time like the others, and they were prepared to avoid uh, predators. They need trainings for this. We are specialized on training animals, parrots, cetaceans. That is very important. You need the trainers to, to show how to do better. And this connection with the people of the field to asking to our expert here and to give the best recommendation was crucial. You need this. You need the, the experience in, in good source and modern zoos that, that uh, working every day with this. These, these people are specialized on this. And we want to count with all the people in every corner, in every part. And this is the, the success of the project. And one important thing, every pair of um, these birds need around 10 years to start the breeding. Then you need a decade to have a good breeding process because the, the parrots need to learn how to eat, how to, to breed, or the male need to know exactly by instinct to give the correct food to the female and to the female must to know about incubation. Every behavior we have experienced here with our parrots because we do every, every day. We control in incubators and by the parents more than 1,000 eggs every year. Imagine. If, so I've been impo uh, involved with a couple of reintroduction pr um, projects. And one of the things you mentioned uh, a little while ago was when you release them and then, like you said, you close the cycle and they start to, to uh, be a sustainable population on their own. That's as good as it gets. That's why all the millions of dollars you said you guys have brought in, all the millions of people, like everything, that's all for that. That is why we do everything we do. And, you know, maybe we get nerded out a little bit, but it's just so exciting when that actually happens because you can put so much time and, you know, uh, what was it, Taylor? The uh, sea turtles, we were talking about that. Sea turtles are starting to recover in certain areas, but they've been working on them for 35, 40 years and with really no, not much success. But because the life cycle of sea turtles is so slow compared to the, uh, you know, the quarterly work that we do, they're actually starting to see some results in some areas and sea turtles are coming back. And so it, it's just so exciting to see that. But one question I had is, so you think of uh, recovering parrots, captively breeding parrots, macaws, you, you're kind of like, okay, well, that's really, really cool. But you know, it's not like it's big cats. That's that's dangerous, you know. But then I just read <laughs> that macaws have a bite power 
of three times of like a German Shepherd dog. And so I was like, well, actually, maybe it isn't that safe. <laughs> Is that true that macaws can like take a finger off? Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, they, they destroy very easy the wire of, uh, of one uh, big cage. They can destroy very easy because every day they can uh, chewing uh, there uh, only to play, not, not to destroy because they want to, to maintain in the place. That is very interesting. And we work with the palm cockatoos. The palm cockatoo is one of the third bite more stronger in the in the world, like jaguars or uh, is, or, or alligators, that they, they have a lot of press. Uh, that is something to avoid and that we know very well because the management for us uh, is something that uh, we do every day. That's incredible. Um... Just and so I'll, I'll follow up on that because Austin brings up the fact that these things are actually really strong bite, really strong claws, but they're also really smart, right? Really smart, really smart. And this is one question because in the last uh, weeks, I made different interviews by in radio here in Spain that asking uh, because the intelligence of the parrot because they can repeat the the words and not al always repeat means understand uh, but the parrots can do this the parrot that is something that the the max plan work with us here to understand how the, it works for a so little brain it's amazing that they can associate perfectly the different things why that is uh, w the question right now that we want to discover because in nature we know that it's very important to remember where are the p the places they need always a, a teacher for the rest of the group. That is because they are very social and they need the contact. And the, the ability to be mimic with uh, the different uh, sounds is very important to avoid predators, to communicate to the people. The parrots, usually when the, the flock go to the floor because on the ground exists one seeds or one resource, always two or three are on the top of the crown of the trees to advise if one predators come and then they go the whole flocking go together the communication between them are very important and of course they have a language to understand is what we do with cetaceans here that we learn the language of orcas dolphins and so constantly with sonograph and so on it's very very important and we will discover more about the, the intelligence of parrot they are really smart they they can determine how you wear your clothes and we speak with our parrots in this way that is very interesting in the breeding center i come always with my black t-shirt the the head of the staff are always in black the the workers are in brown they give in food they are not dangerous people when i come in white i say to the parrots look the clinical team come and they take another position, but you advise them that you do this. And that is important. I don't want to come with my black shirt and they, they, they don't know exactly my intention. I want to say, ah, when I come in black, I want only to see you. I don't make interaction and so And when I want to speak with them, I can use another, another t-shirt and they, they react to this. Uh, that means that the behavior the language of our behavior is very important. Our researchers here, we have right now from India, from Germany, uh, from France, from Spain, researchers that uh, uh, making the final of the cyclone, they make the PhD uh, work here by us in the, in the animal embassy, in the place of the Max Planck. And it's very interesting because they need to use sunglasses that cover the eyes because only with the eyes, the parrots can discover the different experiments and to avoid this they need to to use this and it's interesting because our public here in loro parque can see directly all this experiment and asking about this we we uh, explain to the children because they asking uh, immediately they, uh, why they have sunglasses they don't need inside the the experiment room ah that is because of this you know how important it is to say to a, a a kid to explain how it works an experiment maybe you have a new biologist for the next future from one million people for sure 
uh, percentage of these people will be sensitive to, to nature. That is our main goal here. Okay, so we've talked about a little bit about the uh, uh, success stories that Laurel Park, Laurel Park Foundation has, uh, has had. Um, including some, like I think it's, uh, we have a list here of five or six species that have been upgraded on their conservation status. And that's, uh, for the listeners, that's the IUCN red list of species conservation status from least concern all the way down to very endangered and, you know, extinct in the wild, uh, those kinds of things. And through the work that you guys have done, you've been able to increase the level from, you know, threatened up to least concern or whatever it is. With those successes, can you talk about how uh, Laurel Parque Foundation became a center for species survival? Sure. Yeah, okay. We we realized not because the parrots. The, the thing is that uh, here on the island, uh, we are very well recognized as a center that help uh, nature rescue of uh, sea turtles. Or when one cetacean have a problem here in Macaronesia, in the whole region, have a problem. And we became... Uh, the, uh, this center of, uh, of uh, survival of species because the critical species in Macaronesia need the work uh, here. And we focus on all the species that need here and we make a revision of all the species that are critical and, danger and dangerous. And why here in, a, in the Canary Island, in Loro Parque specifically, is clear. The thing is that we are in the in one hotspot of endangered species here in, in the Canaries. The hotspot of biodiversity is the most important thing. And we work right now with nails that uh, nobody can imagine that uh, maybe it's not so interesting for the politicians or so when you speak about a snail or, or you speak about a cube of a jaguar or something like this. And we want to focus uh, on this because we have the model, we have the success with many, many species, and it's important to be here with a presence in the Macaronesia. That means Azores, Cabo Verde, and the Canary Island. And this is the, 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 main, the, the main goal. Like, how did you become interested in conservation work? Okay, when I was a kid, I want to see birds. I have a lot of interest in dogs and uh, reptiles, lizards, everything. And it uh, was very difficult because my family don't want to give to me one animal at home as pet. I start so with eight years or so on. And uh, I first with a canary birds because all the canary birds of the world coming from here, from the Canary Island. I start with this. I start with the observation of my birds at home and later in nature. And when I, come, I came to the, to the university, my teachers say, Oof, you know so much because you observe the, the birds in both places. That was my start. I, I recognized the power of to have the knowledge in nature and under the human cave. And uh, OK, I applied to my work here in Loro Parque Fundación and, and the team is very strong because our president, the, the director, he's specialized in marine uh, science. And the team is very complex, and all the people here have the same passion. And this passion is so important. This is what we want to share. This knowledge. Knowledge at final is the key to take all the people with us and all the people that are curious, because curiosity was my, my end, no? my horizon. And when the people want to be curious, we have the information. That is what we do connected the people to make conservation. That is our, our system. So when I hear that, I, I immediately am inspired by you and the work that uh, Laurel Park is, is doing. And it, it makes me kind of want to you know, take a step back and think, you know, for, for you, when you, either when you were coming up in your career or even now, like, what are your inspirations? Is it, is it just the, the parrots that you just got to keep going with these parrots and you, like, you cannot stop until all parrots are saved? Or, or were there, um, you know, books or people that you worked with that kind of get you, that got you like, you know, okay, wow, I really, I really want to do this and I can do this? The inspiration is the contact with animals. It's the same, not only parrots. I am, I am met 
about like you are, and <laughs> and Taylor. We are met about animals, and when you have the opportunity, you will develop perfectly. I, I, I participated in one project in Gran Canaria, in the other island, with one, the blue chaffinch. It's an endemic species in the red list to, uh, of uh, an endemic bird from here, from the Canary Island. We, uh, we help in the breeding of the species to reintroduce in nature with success in the, in some years ago. And I remember when the government called me to help uh, to make the census in nature and to breeding. Uh, to have success in breeding because they didn't have success in many years. They have the installation, but not the knowledge for the breeding. And it was a honor, it was, was so good for me because I can help directly a species that maintain right now less than 400 exemplars in nature. We've, we've talked about how sometimes these projects can take, you know, decades and to, to actually be successful. And, and it takes, you know, work day in, day out for 10 years to even see even a small little bit of success. So the way we see that is like, you need to have some sort of optimistic uh, mindset or some hope that what you're doing is the right thing and it's actually gonna work out. So what does, how, how does that, how do you incorporate that into your day to day? Do you, or is it, you, you mentioned curiosity and I feel like if you're co constantly curious, you're not really jaded at all. You're, you're kind of always kind of, you know, optimistic. If you're curious, you're like, oh, how would we do this? How do we fix that? So it, how does the optimism and hope kind of mix in with the curiosity that you guys are saying that it, that is your spirit? To be optimistic is the, the most important because sometimes it's difficult to work with animals. It's a, a challenge. The animals, uh, you need to maintain, uh, the people saying, ah, you maintain so many parts, that is easy. Only put some grains and no, no, no. You must to fight against uh, illness to control virus. We make PCR here many years before than the people speaking about COVID that the, the whole population discovered about PCR. Our biosecurity system is very strong, but we developed with a lot of efforts many years ago because we are optimistic. We know that we, look, we, we, we working right now with the uh, Pirura Subandina, that is in Colombia, that is the Sinu parakeet. The Sinu parakeet disappeared. Uh, less than 49 exemplars are in the red list uh, counted about the bird. And many other ONGs follow this bird and didn't have success until now. But we are optimistic. We really think that we have the tools to discover the bird. And not only with acoustic device, we're working right now in the Sinu area to, to find the, the bird. And we have some signals from people that come not from the scientific world, are from people of the population that there where we, 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 we say, we saying, we reward uh, the animal with 1 million pesos, is the, the, the coin of, of uh, Colombia, uh, for the local people to find the, the correct sign or the correct signal, the, 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 the way to find the bird. And we, we have discovered new species that didn't wear on this area and are new for the science in Colombia, in this area, because the Sinu parakeet. Then when you help this with optimistic, I am quite sure that at final we will find the, the bird because the world can only live when we help nature to survive. And uh, we must to be clever on this and we must to work more all together. And that is why it's so important the reverse the red uh, system. And, and I have seen here in the, in the meeting how important it is to be connected. I am very proud because I am here with the first chick of Lears Macau in Loro Parque Fundacion. And right now I am involved in nature with the conservation project where we can say that another chick that is uh, from descendants of these uh, first birds are not now in nature and can breed alone. I think that nothing is more uh, brilliant or important for uh, somebody like you and me that are involved in, in a process of, of conservation. Nothing is, is more bigger than, than this, it's impossible. 
Raphael, thank you so much. That was, that was amazing and very, very inspiring. We really appreciate you taking the time and sharing all the work that you guys do. It's uh, truly amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you to you and to have this uh, good time together. It was fantastic. Thank you again for tuning in. We would like to thank Rafael for taking the time to talk with us and for all of the amazing work he's done for decades. Now this is the year of action for Reverse the Red, so please look into how you can help save the bird species in your area and get involved. The host, editor, and producer is Austin Parker. Producers are Taylor Parker, Megan Joyce, Dr. Judy Mann, and Alex Duckles. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time.